While Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis is still regarded as one of the best video games ever made, it isn't as enjoyable to play today as it was 30 years ago. Don't get me wrong, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis is an unassailable classic of the point and click genre. I'm not disputing that, however, its very time appropriate adventure mechanics make it at best extremely frustrating to play by an audience with modern expectations and at worst make it unplayable. This is indeed a great game that has solid writing, extremely good voice acting and music, I'll put it in the box too, an engaging quasi sorta of branch story, but real talk, I would not have finished the game because of these mechanics if I wasn't planning on covering it. More about my issues with it towards the end of the video. For now, let's talk about all the cool stuff and there's quite a bit of it. Actually, most of it is hella cool. I simply must start with the beginning, the title screen zooming into the foreground in a very movie-like way, being accompanied by a great MIDI rendition of the classic Indiana Jones movie score. The cool factor doesn't end there, because this turns into an interactive intro scene where you can direct Indy around the place till you start the game proper. This also gives us an interesting look at some of the visual style that will regale our eyeballs for the next several hours. Fluid animation, stylized pixel art, because the resolutions of the time didn't allow for that many pixels to be squeezed into a square centimeter, and fairly easy to spot and responsive hotspots, which are pretty important in a point and click. In the scenes where a lot of color is easy to use and makes sense, things look as you would pretty much expect them to in cities and even the desert. However, there are areas of the game where the palette is fairly limited and that's where you can see a lot of the artistry in these old pixel art games, how wonderful shades and nuances beyond the 256 possible at the time are basically optically illusioned into our brains. One really cool technique the developers used, twice actually, is how they use shadow and darkness. There are two screens in the game where you will enter in the dark. Initially, the screen is basically pitch black with a few hotspots being only visible when sweeping with the cursor. However, the more time you spend in both these scenes, the more details you start to see as Indiana's eyes adjust to the darkness. I thought that was a really cool and great gameplay touch that reflected reality fairly well. The visuals are undoubtedly great and the rotoscoped animations in particular are super cool and quite a pleasure to witness, but what makes the even larger impact is the music and the voice acting. And this will only matter if you're playing the second release of the game, which was a CD-ROM release that included digitized music and voice acting. I mentioned the Simply Stellar rendition of the Indiana Jones theme at the start of the game, but what I hadn't realized till well into the game is that it had a score that travels and follows you all throughout the game. Normally a great idea, unfortunately. When it comes to older point and click games, and this is something I mentioned tangentially during my analysis of Grim Fandango as well, there will be places where you simply get stuck for hours, days, maybe longer, and the same music will run on a continuous loop for that time and you will grow to despise it. But anyway, that's neither here nor there, just the other side of the coin of having music all throughout the game, but really nice overall. In terms of voice acting, it was really important to get Indiana Jones right. And even though Harrison Ford isn't the one voicing the character, the actor they got manages to honor the spirit of the character very well. Exploring our collections can be dangerous, Mr. Uh, well, if that's how you feel, maybe you should stay here. Maybe I will. Great idea. Fine. Fine. He most likely couldn't or didn't want to do a Harrison Ford impression and instead did his own take on the character's voice and honestly, the voice summons an utterly credible Indiana Jones quite well. I never thought of Harrison Ford's voice during the playthrough at all. And when a different performer makes you forget about the originator, well that's a great performance. In terms of how the game is structured, Fate of Atlantis comes with a fairly innovative approach for the time, offering players three different playthrough experiences. Each game will start the same, but relatively quickly there is a point in the story where these three branches diverge. 
The experiences are called wits, team and fists. And while they won't be named as such when they're presented in the game, that's what they're named in the manual. The Wits playthrough will have Indiana venturing alone on this quest and encountering the more difficult puzzles because of this. This was the path I chose, but more about that later in the video. The team playthrough will have Indiana team up with Sophia, a character introduced in this game, an ex-archaeologist who is now a psychic. Allegedly. One could argue this would be the experience most true to the spirit of the movies seeing as how Indiana Jones will generally have a lady partner on his film adventures at least. The Fist's playthrough will feature more brawling than the rest, which again is a staple of the Indiana Jones movies as well. Not something I'm terribly interested in though, but I do appreciate the experimenting with gameplay mechanics taking place here. Each of these parallel stories will start and end in the same places, however the journey they take will differ to a certain degree, and likewise so will the puzzles you encounter. That being said, there is a certain amount of optional things you can do in each playthrough and this will reflect in your end score and could affect the ending. The puzzles themselves aren't as obtuse or moon logic -y as I was expecting for a point and click from this era. And I have to hand it to the designers for innovating and creating a much wider variety of puzzles than the usual dialogue related and item combination ones. I should also note that you cannot really die in Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and this was fairly new for the period as well. There are puzzles that will have you deciphering written text, one that has you illustrated as a mere dot in a mass of humanity, one that will have you find a place on a map and unfortunately a bit too many maze puzzles. Uh, but again more about those later in the video. The story itself fits quite neatly into the Indiana Jones world dealing with ancient relics from a long gone civilization that are maybe a little bit more than they seem at first sight. I won't go into details because discovering the story is a major part of playing an adventure game but rest assured it's a solid one that could have just as well been a great movie. The writing is really fun as well with the dialogue being filled with all manner of jokes, references and insults. The characters are well served by it and you never really get the sense that the people behind the game were out of their league or out of their comfort zone. One of my favorite pieces of writing are the many instances Indiana gets called in Algiers. May the sand cover you without a trace. May the sun addle your brain and coop your flesh. May the wind scatter your bones where none shall find them. May a goat be the mother of your children. May you die without water, Jones. So the game has great visuals, music, voice acting, story, writing, has three different playthrough alternatives as well as several ending variations. So what are the issues with the game's mechanics that make it almost unplayable? One word answer. Mazes. And I'm not talking about the actual labyrinth stage, which is arguably less mazy than you'd think, but I'm talking about the maze puzzles. Puzzles where you basically have to find your way out of a maze. There are several variations of these in the game, at least on the Wits playthrough. There is a car chase followed by having to look for a street intersection, then there's desert explosion by camel, then there's hot air ballooning. And don't get me wrong, these are all very Indiana Jones type activities, but they do tack on the time. A fair bit of it and can prove to be way more frustrating than the actual puzzles. But those examples are short-lived, you get the hang of them relatively quickly and solve them likewise. But then you eventually get to Atlantis. Where you won't have just one maze, but two. The first maze is the entire outer ring of Atlantis. This is an actual maze divided into four quarters, which has a few static rooms and a shit ton of variable rooms which randomize on each playthrough. Not only are these variable rooms randomized, but they also teleport you from one side of the outer ring to another and into areas you can't get otherwise. So here's the first hint that will save you time. Make yourself a map of the outer ring maze and write down where each room takes you. And that by itself would be pretty sucky, especially if you're going into the game cold, but it gets extra annoying because this ring is also patrolled by Nazi soldiers. In the wits path you can simply tell them you're not fighting and just go on your way, but that still takes time and is incredibly flow breaking especially when it comes to navigating a fucking maze. All of this would be outrageous enough, 
but the annoyance of solving this maze is then compounded by the game requiring you to backtrack a fair bit, in case you weren't inspired enough to pick up a bunch of items after already using them. So hint number two, do yourselves a favor and once you open up the door to Atlantis, pick up the discs and the ladder, this is gonna save you a veritable fuck ton of backtracking. And then after solving this veritable maze, the game gets you into another one just before the final screen. And this being one of those teleporting mazes, I call them, where there is a bunch of doors and each one takes you to a different exit on a different screen in this case. So you have to spend time mapping these ones as well. Can you see what I mean? Why I would have normally dropped the game? Maze mapping isn't a thing anymore in terms of point and click design. It's fine in a dungeon crawler, sure, that's what you're signing up for, but even there, auto map features have been around for some time now. Likewise, backtracking to get items you already used to solve puzzles isn't a thing in modern design either. They were 30 years ago, but not today. Nowadays, one most likely expects to find a solution to a puzzle inside the screen the puzzle is located in, or at the very most, a few screens away. The era of spending days upon weeks on weird annoying puzzles has long gone, especially because nowadays you can find solutions and walkthroughs just as easily as you can find the games. So there is not even social currency or reputation we can gain from doing it either. Because anyone can do it quite easily. And that takes away any and all reasons for these types of mechanics to exist, hence why they aren't really a thing anymore. When I initially thought of doing this video, I wanted to play through all three variations of the game. I was gonna make this ginormous comparative video and weigh which playthrough was cooler and why, but after basically quitting the game a couple of times because of the mazes, I just couldn't do that to myself, not once, but two more times. I have a limited amount of time left in this plane of existence and I won't spend any more of it playing Fate of Atlantis nor will I suggest you play it either. Unless you've already played it 20 or 30 years ago and have nostalgic feelings related to it, or you're super into retro adventures and want to get the time appropriate experience. Otherwise, if you want to have fun, this isn't the game you're looking for. Unless mapping mazes is fun for you, in which case you will have an absolute blast. And for those of you wondering where Fate of Atlantis fits within the overall Indiana Jones timeline, it is set in 1939, so it takes place after Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. As for where the IP went after Fate of Atlantis, a Sega CD version of the game was in development but it never got released because the Secret of Monkey Island failed on the platform. Two separate follow-up games were in development at different times and for varying periods of time. One was called Indiana Jones and the Iron Phoenix and the other Indiana Jones and the Spear of Destiny. Neither of these made it to any gaming platform, however, their scripts were later made into four-part comic book series. In terms of actual video games, the next time we'd see Indiana Jones would be in Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures in 1996. Which I had no idea existed before making this video. What I did know existed that looked like this is a game called Yoda Stories, which apparently is a sequel to this game. The more you know. Huh. But the title most people are aware of as following Fate of Atlantis is Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine in 1999 which presented Indy for the first time in full-fledged 3D on the PC, Nintendo 64 and Game Boy Color, but in an action-adventure format. In case you want to check out some other adventure game videos of mine, click right here. I've been Steven Ansons, I have a Patreon, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in my next video.